Yes, good morning everyone. Welcome to Asumi's Gospel Service this morning where it is an honor to be before you and know how blessed, truly, truly blessed because I'm here under God's grace and mercy to celebrate Him one more day. Amen. God is good. Um, we go through so much. And sometimes we'll, so the way the world works is we go through stuff and sometimes we don't know what we're going through until we're about out of it. And I think that's what God considers us being overcomers. Amen. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. It's been a long week. It's been a hot summer. My gosh. But God is still good because we're still here. Amen. Grab your Bibles. We're going to go to Proverbs chapter 4. We'll be reading verses 20. Three to 27. This is Psalms, one of Solomon's instructions for us in Proverbs. I love Proverbs because it speaks of wisdom. Wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge beyond your years that you have. Would you please stand with me for the reading of God's Word? That's Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 and 27. We have it say amen. Proverbs chapter 4, 23 to 27. And it reads, Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a forward mouth and perverse lips. Put far from thee. Let thy eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet. And let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor the left. Remove thy feet from evil. I read that because sometimes we get lost in translation. What I mean is, sometimes we get so wrapped up in the world or, or, or work or friends or family, we forget to look straight ahead to what God has for us. We forget. And this reminds me that I need to continue to have my eyes focused on Him. Because that's where my help comes from. And I understand that I can't do it without it. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning, God, because we understand that all we have to do is look up at the hills, God. Keep our eyes on you. Because, God, you're the center of us all. And we thank you, God, for just allowing us to be here another day under your grace and mercy. It is nothing that we've done that great that we're deserving of. But God, you saw fit to allow us to be here today to worship and praise you. So we thank you for such an opportunity as you visit us this morning that we can bless your holy name. Give you the praise and glory, God, that you're due for all the things that you've done for us, God. Not the things, God, from the past that you delivered and allowed us to overcome, God, but the things, God, that we're looking forward to so that we can reach our destiny. Father, I actually bless those who are on their way this week. God, give them a speedy movement so they can get here because there's a word that's going to come forth that's just for somebody, just for them, to change their heart and their minds, God. Bless the word that comes forth, God. Bless the man that delivers the word. Father God, we understand that it is hard sometimes to stand before your people and deliver a word that we're unsure that they're going to receive it. But God, we send the word anyway, trusting in your spirit and trusting in who you are, that they're going to be receptive and see, receive what you have for them this morning. Anoint them, God, that this word may be afresh and be a blessing to someone, God, that it may change their life, God, that their mind may be renewed, their spirit, God, may be, God, plugged into yours this morning, God, and may give them a new charge, a new hope, that they may continue to trust on you. Because no matter what, God, we know that we have the victory. Before the world began, God, you gave us the victory. So with that, God, we understand that no matter what we go through, we are going to overcome as long as we give it to you. Father, we ask you to bless our head of state, God. 
Mas actually, schools are ready to start. So God, we actually let those lights that stand shine so that everyone else can see that they are of you. Father, we thank you for your spirit. Father, we thank you, God. We ask you today to visit with us and create a change in our atmosphere. So God, in weeks to come, it will already be set forth. All we have to do, God, is walk in your righteousness. So Father God, we ask you to bless this prayer. And we thank you for giving us your son. Bless this building. Bless this service and every service that's here. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Come on again, Father. Hey, God, praise the Lord because of that word.
bless their households financially, God, so when they come again, God, they will give 200 back to you. So, Father, we ask you to bless you, God, for the uplifting of your kingdom and your precious holy name. Your matchless name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.
to send your angels and deliver your word to whoever they have on their hearts this morning. That God, their cares, their fears, God, and discouragement, no matter what they go through, God. No matter how their minds messed up or their hearts been broken or they just can't understand why me. Why would they pray turn against them? Send your angels, God. We are in need of you on today and every day. We need you, God. We can't make a step without you ordering it. We don't want to do anything, God, that's called out of the order of you. So, God, we ask you, God, to give us a clean heart this morning. Allow us, God, to examine ourselves daily so we can really see who we are. And that we're deserving of your grace. That we're deserving of your mercy, God. We ask you to give us a good heart this morning. That we may serve you holy and righteously. That we may praise and worship you freely with no slow moves. Break the chains, 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 break the chains of emotions. Broken emotions. Break the chains of the broken hearted. Break the chains, God, of those who are worried and concerned about their physical condition. Break those bloodline curses this morning, God. So, God, we can be elevated in your spirit. Because, Father, sometimes we worry too much about getting elevated of ourselves. But, God, we must understand today that promotion, spiritually and naturally, God, only comes from you. So, Father God, I ask your spirit to move in this place right now. Move in this place, God. Somebody may have a renewed mind of you. The thought of you may be different and not the same. Their hearts may be changed and see the world differently. So, Father, we thank you this morning, God, for just visiting with us this morning. Changing our environment and our atmosphere and hearing our prayers. God, I thank you for the one on one relationship that I have with you. To me, that's the most precious thing to me. Because I understand that my relationship with you is more beneficial, more powerful than anything in this world. So, God, I ask you right now, God, to renew our relationship with you. Renew our relationship with you daily. As we fall on our knees, God, we cry out to you, God. And we bless your holy name, God. And we give you the glory, God. We just want you to pour out our blessing, and God. And pour out your spirit, God. And pour out your anointing, God. Renew our relationship daily with you, God. God, we understand it's hard, but nothing hard has ever broken. That means, God, that when we shape our relationship with you, God, it will stay. They will stand against the naysayers and the backbiters, God, those who talk about us and those who doubt us. Our relationship will stand. And I have confidence and trust enough to know that you will allow me to overcome all those things. So, Father, we thank you this morning, God, for just you being so sweet to us. I learned in BBS, God, that you are just so sweet to us, God. So sweet to us. And I don't know why, but you are. And I thank you for that. Because it's nothing that I've done that great. That you're so good to me. But I thank you for just being so good just to me. So Father, we ask you to bless this prayer, God. And thank you for visiting to us, God. And we thank you for sending your angels that's going to take care of our worries and our cares, God, our strife, God. And we thank you for giving us a renewed mind, a heart, and renewing our relationship with you today. Father, we thank you this morning. But God, but you, God, thank you for never changing and always being the same. Because I don't know what I would do without you. And your precious and holy son is in you. Amen. Glory to God, you God, praise Oh, come on, praise Jesus. Let's dance with us. You all can just stand with us.
the nation of Israel. Um, what they would do is they had a localized spot where everybody had to travel to. And for some, it took days. Okay? And so they'd have to actually leave home and they'd have to put all of their provisions in for this, these, this trip and they would travel along the way. And when they finally got to uh, the temple area, they had to go into uh, the city and then they had to go into the court of the Gentiles and then they had to go into the inner court. And then finally, they have the Holy of Holies. It was a, a movement. And worship involves movement. So the question I have for you as we start our message time is, how far do you need We are here, we're servants, we're prompters, okay? You are worshipers and there's an audience of one. No one in here is in the audience. You understand? You are worshiping the God. He is. correct. 
We're going to talk about one of the New, New Testament passages that we're going to talk about um, in, involved in this text. Okay? So we have an Old Testament main passage, and then we have several different New Testament passages that we're going to talk about. Um, de deals with, it's found in, in, in Romans chapter 14, verse 1, and it deals with what we call disputable matters. What I'll tell you later on, I'll probably just, I'll do it now just for, uh, by way of introduction. Disputable matters is something that is an issue of reason. I'll give you an example. How you worship is a disputable matter. Who you worship is not. Does that make sense? So you can talk about stylistic deals all the time. You know, I was talking to Corey because I really want the service. And, and maybe, hey, maybe we need to have a different guy up here. Fantastic, you know. What? Why? Because it's not an issue of reasonable matter. Reasonable matter is how we organize this thing. Who we worship is not disputable. We worship God our Father. We elevate the Lord Jesus Christ. We trust the Spirit living in us to guide and motivate us. Are we all on the same page? I hope so, because if not, then we see the effort. Okay? You know, I want to make sure we're on the same page. So, just want to bring those things to your attention. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. So you are saved by grace through faith. Now, the, the passage that we seem to forget is Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, which says, just as you receive Jesus as Savior, so walk in Him. How did you receive Him? By grace. So walk in that grace. The first Peter three eighteen says, Jesus Christ died once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. Live in that. Your sin has been paid for. Salvation and forgiveness is free. But you have to do one thing. The benefit from a gift that already belongs to you. You simply have to take it. If you leave it there, you don't benefit from it. Is that pretty simple? All right. Let's get into our passage here. 1 Samuel chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Follow along with me. I'll be reading from the New International Version. It says this. Saul said to all Israel, I have listened to everything that you have said to me, and I have set a king over you now. You have a king as your leader. As for me, I'm old and gray, and my sons are here with me, and I have been your leader since my youth until this day. Here, here I stand, testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? Uh, from whose hand have I accepted a bribe to make me shut my eyes? If I have done any of these, I will make it right. Verse 4. You have not cheated or oppressed us, they replied. You have not taken anything from anyone's hand. Samuel said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and also his anointed is witness this day, that you have not found anything in my hand. He is witness, they said. Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your forefathers up out of Egypt. Now then, stand here because I am going to confront you with evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your fathers. After Jacob entered Egypt, they cried out, uh, to the Lord for help, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought, the, who brought your forefathers out of Egypt and settled them in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God, so that he, so that he sold them into the hand of Sisera, the, command, uh, the commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the, the Philistines and the king of Moab, who fought against them. They cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned. We have forsaken the Lord and have served the Baals and Ashtoreth. 
But now deliver us from the hands of our enemies, and we will serve you. Then the Lord sent Jephthah, Barak, Jephthah, and Samuel to deliver you from the hands of your enemies on every side, so that you live securely. But when you saw that Naash, king of the Ammonites, was moving against you, you said to me, No, we want a king to rule over us, even though the Lord your God was your king. Now, here is the king that you have chosen, the one you asked for. See, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve and obey him, and do not rebel against his commands, and if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, good. But if you do not obey the Lord, and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your fathers. Now then, stand still and see this great thing the Lord is about to do before your eyes. Amen. Let's pray. God, great passage. Thank you for all that you are doing in our hearts and in our minds. Instruct us, Father, so that we can understand how close you desire to be with us. May everything that is done today bring honor and glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in His name that I pray. Amen. Um, I've broken this message into two parts, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But when I was young, uh, maybe you're like this. My folks uh, taught me the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you, which is actually a quote from... Luke 6.31. Now, my parents did not hold this summer test. Matter of fact, they used to get in trouble for telling jokes and talking at the dinner table. Such was the late 1960s. Um, so there was no do unto others before others do unto you. <laughs> they taught me the golden rule. In a very real sense, my parents were legalistic. Okay? Um, where they would showcase the faults of others while trying to hide their own. Now, don't get me wrong, my parents changed when they finally came to know Christ, but our passage today outlines the prudent acts of confrontation within the context of divine sovereignty. Okay. For time's sake, like I mentioned before, I've broken this into two parts, so if you want the second half, you're going to have to come back next week. Can't get through all this, but we'll deal with the rest of the chapter then. Our supplementary passage is actually found in Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. You can turn to that if you want to. I'll read it for you real quick. It says this Jesus is speaking, Why do you look at the speck sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank that's in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. So that's our intro. And it brings me to my key idea. Proper confrontation begins with examining your own life. Then, and please check this out, then you will be able to help others as you are growing in your relationship with God. This is not, oh, hey, I want to take the speck out of my eye so I can go and correct you. No, I'm going to take the speck out of my eye because I want to continue growing in my relationship with God as I am helping you. Okay? I don't have the right to be anybody's judge. I don't have the ability to look into somebody's heart and say, oh, hey, you're doing that intentional. Okay? But I do know what's in my heart. And so I have to be honest with myself. And I have to deal with myself first, which brings me to my first point. First things first, the first point is me confront me. So there are four things involved in this. Look at the passage. You can find these in verses 1 through 6. 
The first part of me confronting me is to take an honest look at myself. Notice that Samuel puts his life under the microscope in verses 1 and 2. He says this. I'll, I'll just summarize. He says, I've listened to you. Um, I've done what you asked for. Even though I didn't think it was wise. I'm old. And I've served you a long time. That's basically a recap of what he's talking about there. Then he turns God's penetrating white light on the situation. In other words, what he does is he draws everybody's attention to the judge that's in the courtroom. Okay? Look at verse 3. The first part. He says, Here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Alright? He puts himself under the microscope. He turns on that white light, that white light of God's purity. Okay? And says, hey, tell me the truth. What have I done? I gave you what you asked for. Okay? I'm old. I've been here a long time. I've served you. The word testify in the Hebrew is used nine different times and it means to witness or to announce. So that's the first thing. Put the microscope on you. Second part, okay? Give others a chance to respond and be willing to reconcile. You see that at the end of verse 3. He said, what have I taken? Uh, who have I cheated? Who have I oppressed? What bribe, is I, what bribe have I received? And then the third part is he waits. And then they finally come back and say, hey, you haven't cheated us. You haven't wronged us. He gave them a chance to respond. And this is the fourth thing that we see here. They say in verse 4, you have done nothing wrong. And so he recaps for clarification. And what he states there is that any unresolved issues need to be taken to the, to the higher court. Now in verse 5, Samuel references again those two officials that are part of this higher court, the Lord and His anointed. But He offered to reconcile. He waited for them to respond, and then He recapped what was going on to make sure that there was clarification in, in regard to examining His own life. In other words, He put Himself out there first. He confronted Himself. Summer. If your confrontation is going to be godly, you have to deal with the black eye syndrome first. Second point. <clears throat> then you are ready to proceed to step two. And step two is I confront you. God look at me. I give you an opportunity to look at me too. I've asked the questions and stuff like this. Now let's deal with the situation that we're facing here. You can see this in verses 6 through 16. First, when it becomes necessary to confront, understanding the context is important. Now, when I mean understanding the context, I'm talking about the landscape. I'm not necessarily talking about the weeds. That's why I mentioned that thing before. Disputable matter, right? How we do this that's an issue of reason. Who we worship, that's not. Okay? So we talk about how to do this different make, make, make it, but we're going to worship God. Cool? All right? And so this is what he's talking about. Here. He, he starts giving those guys a little bit of the context. He wants them to remember what God had done for them. It says, it is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your forefathers out of Egypt. That's in verse 6. Second, the, the second thing you need to do here when you're, when you're talking about confronting somebody else is you want to stay on point. Okay? You want to stick to the facts. Don't go chasing the rabbits. Verse 7, verse 7, I'm just going to give you the two main points here. He says, I'm going to, 
This is what Samuel says, I am going to confront you with evidence. Okay? Of what God. And then he goes on to say, acts performed by the Lord for you and your fathers. So he lists out what he's going to do. He stays on point. Next thing, he says, you were in trouble, God helped you, and then you forgot him. Verses 8 and 9. So God got your attention. You got taken into captivity. Verse, the second part of verse 9 and verse 10. You cried out and he listened to you. He delivered to you and you forgot him again and again and again. Sounds like a recurring pattern here. Okay? In other words, God has been faithful, but you have not. And so that's the point that Samuel's trying to make here. Then he goes into recent events. Verse 12. He says, when Nathan, when Naas starts to get a little frisky, you start to panic. Like that quote from Wreck and Ralph. You may have seen Wreck and Ralph. Sorry, my daughter and I really, really, really like Wreck and Ralph. Okay. Um, uh, but in the, in the movie it says that it says, you went poo-poo in your big boy shorts. Okay. You remember the quote. In other words, you freaked out. You saw the Aash coming up and you know besieged Jabe, uh, you know, Jabesh, and you're concerned. So what's the point he's trying to make? He's trying to make this one. You still haven't learned that your father can be trusted. God has given to next next thing here. Third, third thing. Make your point and be clear. God has given you everything you ask for, but that doesn't change the requirement. Then what we have is what we have in um, the verses here, verses 14 and 15, we have it, uh, what theologians call a conditional clause. A conditional clause is something if then. All right? So he says this, if you fear the Lord and follow him, then do it. Right? But if you don't fear the Lord, then, so you got the conditional clauses, right? If you don't fear the Lord, then his hand will be against you as it was against your fathers. I like to put it this way. You know, God is not reactionary. He doesn't have to be. He, he, he's omniscient. He knows everything. And so what he's done is he sets standards in place. You know, if I violate a standard, there is a natural result that comes from that violation of standard. Example, ready? I go to the top of the building. I look up into heaven. I say, God, hey, your standard on gravity doesn't apply to me. And I jump off. Guess what? It does apply to you. You're going to hit the ground at a high rate of speed, and you're probably going to hurt yourself. It doesn't have anything to do with God's love for you. Why? Because when you were very little, about that size or something, maybe a little bit bigger, um, God gave you plenty of examples of the law of gravity. If you disregard, if you, if you disregard what He has taught you, that's not His fault. That's yours. You know, and you may hurt yourself, but God still loves you, and God will actually pick you up after you have hurt yourself, because hopefully you learned the lesson. Chaplain Stephen Gottman, a rabbi, he, he, he shared, <laughs> shared a story with me. And I think it was just great. It, 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 it illustrates this thing so perfectly. There was a guy that was walking down the street and he had a brick in his hand, and every five steps he would hit himself in the head with a brick. And so you know, this concerned citizen came up and said, What are you doing? Why are you hitting yourself in the head with a brick? And he says, Because it feels so good when I stop. We do that from time to time, right? We sit there and we, we keep making the same mistake over and over again. We're hitting ourselves in the brick. Well, we're hitting the brick. Why? Because it feels so good when we stop. How about we just go to the brick one? Anyway. Finally, what we see here is Samuel wraps things up by giving them some hope. Verse 16, it says, Now then, stand still and see this great thing the Lord is about to do before your very eyes. And we're going to get to that next week. 
But my final point, which kind of brings us to a little bit of a closure here on this half of the message, <clears throat> is this. God's sovereignty in all confrontation. See, God is in charge. He's in control. If you got your Bible, I hope you do. Take one there. Flip over to Romans chapter 10, verses 11 through 13. I want you to see this. The Apostle Paul says this. He says, as Scripture says, anyone who trusts, anyone who trusts in Him, talking about Jesus, will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Point. God is sovereign. Jesus is Lord of everything. He is sovereign and he gives context to this correct way of doing confrontation. Now, I am intentionally making a distinction between confrontation that is godly and confrontation that is not. Okay? But God can, excuse me, I'm <clears throat> but God can and does use ungodly confrontation to grow us as well. I used to be an associate pastor in Naima, California. Okay, I knew the California is about 38 miles southeast of Fresno. So, you know, Southern California, all you know, right? Okay, some may be easy and so on. Um, I was brought to a disciplinary meeting unknowingly. Okay, because our youth group had grown over 300 percent in a year, and the rest of the church hadn't. And so they wanted to know why. This was the auspice. That I was with, they wanted to know why the youth group was growing, but the rest of the church wasn't. <clears throat> and so I, you know, I'm excited about being here. I laid down this plan for leadership development. I put out this small group, uh, you know, interaction, and all these different things that we were doing and stuff like this. And when I got there, um, yeah, myself and the youngest guy in the room, and I've got 12, 14 different elders, path, and a senior pastor was there, <clears throat> and so on. And so I gave my little spiel, and then right after I gave my little spiel, the senior pastor said, we're here to talk to you about your insubordination. What? That's not what I was told that I was coming here for. And then for the next hour and a half, okay, he told me that I was not listening to the senior pastor, that uh, he told me I needed to be at an event, and I you know, was listening to him as, and, and, and after, the, after about an hour and a half, they finally say, what, what's, your, excuse, what's your explanation? And so I said, well, Tony, um, I need to ask for your permission to leave. And they said, why? I said, well, because I'm not going to tell you that what he has told you is incorrect. They gave me permission to leave. And so I went home. Chairman of the Deacon Board came over by my house that night later on and said, hey, okay, what are we doing? I said, well, I'll turn to my resignation. will be on his desk in the morning. You know? He says, what happened? I said, look, I'm not going to tell you that this guy is not telling me the truth. Okay? Nobody was there. It was just, it's his word versus mine. And so I turned in my resignation. The next Sunday comes up, and, and uh, I'm about ready to go in and make this announcement before my kid, the, my students that I was working with, and then finally into the larger service. And this former deacon wasn't on the board, he wasn't there that night. <clears throat> John Moore, his kids were in my youth group, came up and he said, Hey, I just got word of this. Um, my, 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 my daughter says that you're going to resign this morning. I said, Yeah, it's on the table. It's going to be announced in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> he said, I want you to wait. Something doesn't sound right. And so I trusted John and I said, Okay, John, I'll put a hold on. So we didn't make the announcement. We called an emergency meeting of everyone that was at the meeting the other night, plus John. Okay? I walked into the meeting, and they didn't even give me a chance to say hello. They immediately went into the spiel to bring John up to speed in regard to my insubordination. 
After about 45 minutes or an hour later, um, they finally gave me an opportunity to speak. And I've never heard God speak to me verbally. But I do remember the Spirit kind of just speaking in my mind saying this. Now's the time. And so I look at everyone and I say, gentlemen, with all respect, what you're doing is wrong. Scripture says not to entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. What that means is you cannot believe this person's word over mine. None of you were there. Everyone in that room except for two, the senior pastor and the deacon that was having some moral issues, asked for my apology and my forgiveness. Senior pastor was actually told me I had to go to counseling. The point that I want to make is this God will use ungodly confrontation to grow you in your relationship with Him. Because what He's doing is He's teaching you that even in that type of a situation, He is faithful. I'll tell you what, though. It wasn't fun. But God is sovereign. See, the only difference between godly and ungodly um, confrontation is the goal. An ungodly confrontation, the goal is to showcase the faults of others so that you can hide their own, like my parents, remember? Legalistic. Concern for those involved didn't matter. You know, basically, it was, you're wrong, I'm right, your program is terrible, you mooch the booch royally, and how God can ever use you is beyond my ability to understand. That's what's trying to be portrayed in ungodly confrontation. In godly confrontation, though, because of Jesus, we should have a concern for how confrontation affects others. Why? Well, the other person may not realize the direction that their thought process is taking them. Just like my son did not recognize what direction the path he was taking last night he was going to take him. And he didn't realize how much it was going to cost. Second, this is what this is what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. He says, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The word ignorance is the word agonista means not to know. In other words, if you want it to be really, really blunt, straightforward, straightforward, he's saying, I was shown mercy because I was stupid. Okay? And so we need to extend that grace. They may have been schooled in what we call a belief system instead of being taught what Scripture actually says. Look at this. If this doesn't sound right, go this and check. All right? Please, if you spot something that doesn't make sense, come up, we'll talk about it. All right? I'll show you where it came from. You know, we'll parse it together. But I want you to understand that it's not an issue of, oh, hey, you know, he's all that. But there is a difference between being taught a belief system okay, and being taught what Scripture says. Remember, if you get one degree off course, you're still off course. Finally, like the men of Jabez, they, they, this person may just be freaking out because you, you, you got Naas. You know, parading up Main Street with a rusty spoon in his hand ready to dig out your eye. I mean, they were scared. You know, I'll tell you, when I had to stand before those men, I was scared as well. But God's faithful. So let me wrap up with this. What are we supposed to do? In a phrase, we need to understand and keep God's perspective in mind. Alright? 
here's the point. This great thing that God was about to do was to demonstrate his sovereignty to the people. We'll talk about this next week. God was basically saying, hey, I am your heavenly father, and I love you, and I'm in control. And you need to remember, I'm going to confront every one of you, and I've already looked at my life. You need to remember that the battle is not against people. Ephesians 6.12 Our battle is not against flesh and blood. So, what we need to do is to extend to each other some mercy and some grace. And Romans 14, 1 says, Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. And we already talked about what disputable matters are. <clears throat> the Israelites had made a mistake. They had reasoned that a king would solve all their problems. And they did not know that the only one, the only one who can solve your problem is the Lord Jesus Christ. Their faith was weak. Their relationship with God was not close. Final question I have for you. How close is your Please stand with me. As Tara begins to play, I'm going to ask that you go ahead and bow your head and close your eyes. <clears throat> I, again, I don't know uh, how this uh, message has impacted you. Or I don't know how the morning has impacted you. But during this service, we always have the opportunity, we want to extend the opportunity for anyone who would like to come forward for prayer to do so at this time. Over here on my right, your left, I'm going to have Brother Corey. He's going to go up there and stand. We might have one of our other sisters who is... Uh, you know, one of our prayer words come over and stand. If you need prayer, we invite you to come forward and talk with one of them at this time. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior and you want to come to know Christ this morning, we invite you to take this time as we pray. Our Lord and Savior, our God, our Father, the Spirit who loves us and whom we cry out, Abba, thank you for being in control this way. Father, as you have dealt with my heart, God, as you have dealing with the hearts of those in this room now, I pray, thanking you, that you are going to grow that relationship in us. God, Philippians 1.6, I'm confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father, for carrying on that work in us and for blessing us this morning. For we pray this in the master's name of the one and only, our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, His name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us.